My name is Barbara Altman. I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, and I'm very happy to see you here for the fifth of the six lectures in this series celebrating the bicentennial of the birth of Charles Darwin and the sesquicentennial of his landmark book on the origin of species. Our series began with four faculty members from U of O. Patrick Phillips spoke in January, Warren Holmes in February, Joe Thornton in March, and Francis White in April. This month, we're bringing the series to a close with two outside speakers, Professor Sean Carroll tonight, who is here from the University of Wisconsin, and Kenneth Miller from Brown University, who will deliver the Oregon Humanities Center 2008-2009 Criticos Lecture in this hall on May 27th. Tonight's speaker, Professor Sean Carroll, is Professor of Molecular Biology and Genetics and Investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at the University of Wisconsin. He is here today as the Humanities Center Clark Lecturer for 2009. The Clark Lectureship was established in 1994 with a gift from Bill and Barbara Bowerman. The goal of the lectureship is to promote public discussion on the natural sciences, the history of Oregon, and the interface between science and social and cultural affairs, as exemplified by Thomas Condon of Condon Hall, legendary frontier missionary, geologist, paleontologist, and founding member of the UO Department of Anthropology. The lectureship is named after former UO President Robert D. Clark, who wrote a biography of Thomas Condon. Uh, the biography is entitled The Odyssey of Thomas Condon, and I think Former President Clark would have approved of this particular scientist as eminently worthy of his legacy, as you will see. We're especially happy at the Oregon Humanities Center to be working with, this, with many other units on campus on this series of lectures about Darwin. Our associate director, Julia Hayden, had the foresight to leap enthusiastically at the chance to collaborate with the Department of Biology and several other units when the idea came up. The full list of sponsors includes, as well as the Department of Biology, the Center of, uh, for Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, the Institute of Neuroscience, the Institute of Molecular Biology, and the College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Office. I want to acknowledge our staff at the Oregon Humanities Center, who does such a great job setting up and running these lectures. Uh, and that includes the striking poster that is so beautiful that it keeps being stolen off bulletin boards. We do have extras, please just ask. <laughs> we can give you a clean copy if you want one. <laughs> so much appreciation, therefore, to Melissa Gustafson, Peg Gearhart, Dylan Bragg, Noel Alloy, and our various friends and um, allies who come and help us run these things. For now, let me get back to our guest for the evening. I am simply introducing the introducer, so you'll have someone who knows Professor Carroll's profile better than I do in just a moment. I knew that I would like Professor Carroll's work when I read him described as, among other things, like Rudyard Kipling, only in a lab coat. His books have met with great critical acclaim and many awards because they bridge science and the humanities and show the general public why we should care about evolutionary developmental biology, or evo-devo, as I learned to call it this afternoon in an interview that I did with Professor Carroll. And in fact, I invite you to watch for the UO Today interview with him, which will air in about three weeks and which will be available on the UO channel pretty soon. In fact, his work, although it may be about fruit flies and other various things, um, teaches us about the human condition, and therefore it is of the broadest possible interest. But to give him his due with all of his credentials and his achievements, I'm going to hand off to Professor Patrick Phillips from the Department of Biology. Enjoy the lecture. I'll make this quick so we can get right to the main event. Uh, uh, Dr. Carroll is one of the uh, premier biologists in the United States today. He's uh, started off uh, making really fundamental contributions to developmental genetics and then set his sights on evolutionary biology, as we'll see. And he's really in the process of joining the ranks of uh, people like uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Carl Sagan in uh, bringing the science to the general public. And in particular, he's written a number of books, uh, most recently, The Making of the Fittest and uh, Endless Forms Most Beautiful. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the work that he'll talk about today. 
And these books are uh, now being uh, turned into a Nova special that should come out maybe in October, is what I heard. And Dr. Carroll's just been to the Galapagos to, uh, to film some of that. Uh, so Sean is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's uh, received many awards. Um, he earned his BA at, in biology at Washington University in St. Louis and his PhD in immunology at Tufts Medical School. And he uh, carried out his postdoctoral research at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And, um, and the, the thing that Dr. Carroll doesn't know is that he's actually mostly responsible for this, uh, this lecture series moving forward. So this is our fi fifth lecture. How many have been to all of the lectures so far? All right. So I think our, our last one will be uh, soon. Maybe we'll have to come up with some door prizes or something uh, uh, for those of you who stuck out. So when, uh, when we first conceived of this series, uh, knowing that Dr. Carroll was going to be here uh, for the Streisinger Lecture, which is uh, a named lecture that he is giving tomorrow at 4 o'clock in 100 Willamette, and you're all invited to come to that as well, that will be a much more technical talk about his, uh, his fundamental research. Uh, knowing that he was going to be around anyways made it very easy to think about building an entire lecture series in which he would be one of the uh, capstone speakers. And that's really the genesis of this whole effort, started with the fact that he was going to be here, and then we built a lecture series around him. So uh, without further ado, let's... Uh, okay, and the, the last thing is that, um, as I said, he's a great uh, writer of popular books about science. I highly recommend uh, his work. And... You're lucky because we're having a book signing immediately after the uh, lecture. It'll be out in the lobby area, so you're invited to, um, to come and purchase a book and talk to Dr. Carroll at that time. Now, without further ado, uh, I give you <laughs> Sean Carroll. Hope that short film puts you in the mood for some adventures. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Patrick, for those extremely kind words and that very nice introduction. Thank you, Oregon, for the hospitality and for not hitting me with a tree. <laughs> and thank and the provost is okay. His, his beamer is evidently not. Um, and, uh, and thank all of you for coming out tonight. The, uh, the search for the origin of species, both in general and of specific kinds of creatures, has entailed a series of truly epic adventures over the last 200 years. And uh, I've had a great time chronicling those for uh, my new book. And um, what I want to do tonight is share with you some of those stories and really celebrate the, uh, the explorers that, that undertook these tremendous voyages and, and expeditions. And I'm also going to have to figure out, I'm going to get this thing right. It's the last thing I do. Hold on a second. Projector, data, mic on, PC2. Ah, I figured out your classroom. OK. So I think the author C.W. Sarum described adventure best as a mixture of spirit and deed. And what I hope is you'll come away tonight with some inspiration um, by their spirit and take away a much greater appreciation for the magnitude of their deeds. Now, all over the world, throughout the year, we're celebrating the achievements of Charles Darwin, no doubt our greatest naturalist and the leader of a far-ranging scientific revolution. And my talk tonight is in part my contribution to that party. But my agenda is a little bit broader than that. Uh, Darwin's voyage and works are well known, and, and rightly so, but the making of the theory of evolution and its early growth and acceptance owes a considerable debt to two other men, uh, Alfred Wallace and Henry Walter Bates, who undertook voyages that were even longer in duration and under yet even more difficult circumstances. Now these three men, just noticed something strange that happened on PowerPoint today. You never know. Thank you, Bill Gates. Um, these three men have a lot in common. Uh, they're all Englishmen. They were all extremely eager to leave England to see the glories of the tropics. Um, they were 
all young when they set out on these adventures. Darwin was 22, Henry Walter Bates was 23, Alfred Wallace was 25. They were prodigious collectors. Um, I, I think, in fact, they, they had some form of, of OCD, I, I think obsessive collecting disorder, because <laughs> they pretty much you know, pickled or pinned every bug or bird or critter that they ever saw for the rest of their lives. But most importantly, as, as collectors, they developed an appreciation for the great variety that any individual species exhibited. And from this really hard-earned knowledge, um, they transformed from collectors into scientists and asked questions, not just what creatures existed, but how those creatures came to be. And the pursuit of those questions led each man to unique discoveries. So what I want to do tonight is I want us to walk in the shoes of these three pioneers to see how the theory of evolution by natural selection was born and to see how the creatures that they encountered led them to their respective insights. I think their voyages and their discoveries, they mark really the first golden age of evolutionary biology. And then in the last part of my talk, I want to briefly explain why I think that right now today we're presently in a second golden age of evolutionary science. Now, no one's experiences better fit that description of spirit and deed than Alfred Wallace. And my tales tonight are going to begin with Alfred Russell Wallace in the Amazon in about 1848. Now, Wallace had several purposes in mind in traveling to the Amazon. Uh, perhaps the most simple one was he wanted to get out of England he hated his day job. He had ended schooling at a relatively young age and worked through a series of jobs. And um, he was feeling pretty unfulfilled. He also wanted to build a natural history collection. He was an avid collector. And he had pretty well exhausted what England had to offer. So he proposed to his fellow collector and friend, Henry Walter Bates, that they would go to the Amazon, really, to build a collection for themselves. Simple enough idea. Now, they had one problem. They had no money. So how are they going to support themselves? How are they going to pay for this grand adventure? And the scheme they came up with was, well, OK, we'll, we'll collect for ourselves, but the duplicate specimens, we'll, we'll ship home. We'll sell them back to, for, to Victorian collectors and to museums. And that way, pay our way. And Wallace had one other idea in mind. He explicitly said to Bates, he said, let's also gather facts towards the problem of the origin of species. Now, what was that problem? Well, in the 1840s, this was a question that was very much circulating in British society. There were some anonymous books. There were various articles. But it was a pretty disreputable topic. But nonetheless, it was an open question. And the open question was, were species immutable, specially created by God, as most people thought, as was the doctrine of the Anglican Church? Or were they changeable, the product of natural laws? So in 1848, off Wallace and Bates went to the Amazon, and they landed at Para on the coast of Brazil. And for about a year, they explored this region together. And then they split up to cover more territory, which I think was a Victorian gentleman's way of saying they were getting on each other's nerves. So. We're going to catch up with Bates a little bit later. But what happened was that Wallace made his way first up the main trunk of the Amazon and then up the Rio Negro. And he went so far that he actually went farther than any European had ever gone. By 1852, he was 2,000 miles upriver. Of course, it was an arduous journey, all the way collecting. Now, by 1852, he'd had enough. There's, of course, the physical exertion, tropical diseases, malnutrition. He didn't have time to ship a, a, a lot of specimens as he got further upriver, so he was storing them in crates at various places um, up the river. And he was also taking care of almost three dozen live animals. So his plan was that he was going to take these all the way back to the London Zoo. So he had with him, he had a woolly monkey, and he had a macaw, 
and he had a toucan, and he had these in little cages. And he's saddled with either yellow fever or malaria, trying to feed these things every day, you know, 2,000 miles away from, from the coast. He figures he's got to head for home, or this might kill him. Not an unreasonable fear. So he gathers together his animal cages, starts heading down river, picking up his crates of specimens as he goes along, and gets all the way back to Para to find a boat headed home for England. And he finds a boat, the Helen. He's headed home to England. So he gets all his specimens and animals on board, and, well, what happens next? I'm going to let Wallace tell you in some of his own words. So they're about four weeks out of port, out of Brazil, maybe about 700 miles east of Bermuda, and the captain comes to his cabin and says, I'm afraid the ship's on fire. Come and see what you think of it. Now, Wallace was in a bit of a weakened state anyway. He was still sort of recouping, and, and he, you know, he, oh, the ship's on fire, and he follows the captain to the hold, and sure enough, the hold is smoldering, and it can erupt at any second, and Wallace realized there's no time. He races back to his cabin, and all he has time to do is to grab a little tin box and throw a few shirts in it and grab some drawings of some of the Amazonian fish that he had seen. And then he heads for the lifelines. So with a box in one hand, grabs the ropes, starts to lower himself down to the lifeboats, loses his grip, burns his hands on the rope as he slides down, hits the salt water, which must have felt great on those rope burns, paddles over to the lifeboat, crawls into the lifeboat, and realizes it's leaking. <laughs> and then, from that lifeboat, he watches the Helen burn and sink with all of his specimens. He says, my collections were in the hold, and all the reward of my four years of privation and danger were lost. Now, there are some field biologists in this audience, so I think some of those groans were from them. But he couldn't dwell too long on what he had lost. The next question was survival. Folks, this is 1852. He's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in an open, leaking lifeboat. Day after day, we continued in the boats. We were scorched by the sun, my hands, nose, and ears being completely skinned and drenched every day by the seas and spray. We were constantly wet and had no comfort at night. We had a short allowance of water, which left us constantly thirsty. The shipwreck was eventually memorialized in a, in a book on disasters at sea. So day after day in the lifeboats bobbing there, you think that maybe at some point, Wallace might have pondered, how did I get in this predicament? Well, since one of the purposes he had in going to the Amazon was to solve that problem of the origin of species, if he was going to blame anybody, it would be this guy, Charles Darwin. Because unbeknownst to Wallace, Darwin knew the answer to the question of the origin of species. He knew species changed. He knew from 15 years earlier on his own voyage, he just hadn't told anybody. So how did Darwin know, and how do we know he knew? Well, let's visit a couple of the key stops on Darwin's voyage. Now, I know some of these details are familiar to you, but it's worth recollecting what young Darwin went and did. So at age 22, as I mentioned, just a little bit after Christmas in 1831, he set out on the HMS Beagle. And one of the most important stops he made was along the coast of Argentina. Now, Darwin had some experience in geology, thanks to his last few months in Cambridge, and he was pretty good with a rock hammer and pretty good at finding fossils. And he dug some fossils out of the shore around Bahia Blanca. And he packaged these up and shipped them back home to England, and the experts started identifying them. And it turns out Darwin had found the remains of at least seven different species. And what was remarkable about these species was that, sorry, I should show you the fossils first. He found things like this skull. These are actual drawings of Darwin specimens. The skull, these teeth, jaws vertebrae, et cetera. But what was ra remarkable, these were all mammals, but what was outstanding about them was they were all huge, so-called South American megafauna, like this giant ground sloth. In fact, the species was named after Darwin. This would tower over me. 
huge ground sloths. So while you would not make a lot of this at the time, it certainly was an important set of observations to percolate around his head. He was thinking, well, it's kind of weird. These giant mammals, these things related to sloths and things that seem to resemble armadillos, but clearly they're much bigger than the sloths and the armadillos. And for example, he saw some llama-looking creatures. That they're much bigger than the living inhabitants of South America at the time. So he certainly starts pondering, you know, what's, what's the geological relationship between these extinct animals that I'm digging up these fossils of and the living inhabitants of South America? Well, the beagle keeps voyaging. Now, you've got to appreciate, when Darwin signed up, which was a huge step for him, as you know, his father wasn't initially reluctant to give him permission, he thought he was signing up for a two-year voyage. Well, by the time he got very far into South America, he realized this was going to be a much longer voyage. And you may also know that Darwin never got over his seasickness. So every day on the open ocean with the beagle was a bit of an ordeal. He wrote home and he said to his former mentor, Henslow, he said, you know, I know not how I will endure it. But Henslow wrote back and said, you know, before you quit the voyage, you know, think long and hard about it. See, if you, I'm sure you're going to find things that will keep up your courage. So Darwin stuck with it. And I think what sustained him was simply he didn't know what was going to be around the next corner, the next bay, the next inlet, the next ride he would take inland, what he would see. So he stuck with it. And the beagle made its way along the west coast of South America, finally by about 1835, four years now into this voyage, and finally turned west from the, from, uh, the coast of South America and headed for the Galapagos Islands. Of course, those islands are inextricably linked with Darwin's name. But... Darwin wasn't thinking about the creatures of the Galapagos when they started heading there. He wrote home, he was all excited, he was going to see his first volcano. He had, this, he had a geological bent. He thought, I'm going to see my first volcano. This is going to be terrific. So when he gets to the Galapagos, this is what he sees. He sees a place inhabited by giant tortoises. He refers to them as antediluvian-looking creatures. And ocean-going lizards. I mean, who would have... A lot of such a thing. The sailors called these imps of darkness. <laughs> and kind of humdrum birds like this mockingbird. Now, again, you think given the legend that Darwin would have been, you know, in paradise. He said, no, this is a reptilian paradise. He immediately notes when he first arrives in the Galapagos, the place smells funny, unpleasantly, is too hot, sultry, like an oven. And he says, I think this is what hell is like. So he was pretty happy to leave because he knew what was headed, when he was heading west, he was headed to places like Tahiti and he was looking forward to seeing things like coral reefs. So Darwin moves on. Now he did notice some things. For example, he had collected some mockingbirds on different islands, three slightly different mockingbirds, and each unique to, to each particular island. So that's sort of percolating it around in his mind. But as the beagle heads west, it heads to Tahiti, and then Australia, and then South Africa. And there it is. There's the chance from South Africa to make the turn home. But no, not Darwin's captain. Not <laughs> Fitzroy, OK? Fitzroy decides he wants to recheck some measurements that he had made and heads back to South America. Darwin writes home, I loathe, I abhor the sea and all ships which sail on it. <laughs> but if he's going to be stuck on the boat, he figures, I, I'm going to have to make use of this time. Now, after over four years of voyaging, he had a lot of notes, tremendous amount of field notes. And his handwriting wasn't so good. So his plan was that he would not only just turn specimens over, but turn his notes over to expert scientists in England who would help him identify and sort of do a proper scientific study of the things that he had seen. Plants, animals, fossils, mineral specimens, rocks, etc. So he starts organizing his notes so that other people can read them, and he starts working on his notes on the birds that he's seen. And when he's organizing his notes, he has his first real flash of insight. So there are those notes. This is an actual page from Darwin's ornithology notebook. And these various entries are particular birds and either where he found them or any description he had of them. And he starts 
recollecting those mockingbirds from the Galapagos Islands. And he says, right here in the notebook, he says, when I see these islands in sight of each other and possessed of but a scanty stock of animals, tenanted by these birds, but slightly differing in structure and filling the same place in nature, I must suspect they're only variety. He says, and here's the statement right here, if there is the slightest foundation for these remarks, the zoology of archipelagos will be well worth examining, for such facts would undermine the stability of species. In the last two months of the voyage, he has his first eureka moment. Species may not be stable. These slight differences in the mockingbirds are arousing his suspicions. Well, he finally arrives home, and he enters a phase that he refers to as mental rioting. This idea about species and species changing just takes hold of him. And he starts writing down in stream of consciousness fashion in notebooks that he just carries in his pocket as he's walking around all day, even just walking around London, stopping and jotting down notes. So here's some entries from a particular notebook that he's carrying around in 1837. He's thinking back at what he's seen on this voyage. And he says, you know, we may look at Megatherium, which is another type of giant fossil ground sloth he found, armadillos and sloths as all offsprings of some still older type. So he's thinking there's these living animals walking around South America, and there's extinct ones in the ground, but there might even still be older types that they're offsprings of. You know, I see organized beings, they represent a tree, irregularly branched. Some branches are far more branched, as many terminal buds dying, going extinct, as new ones generated. And he thinks about, you know, when he found these fossils, he found things that looked like sloths in South America, but he didn't see sloths in Tahiti. He didn't see sloths in Australia. He saw different sorts of fauna. He says, you know, I, I see there's a similarity of animals in one country. That must be their, owing to their springing from one branch. And then on the very next page of this notebook, he writes, of course, perhaps the most famous diagram in all of natural history, because it's an entirely new system of natural history, where he's explaining the origin of species as being descended from pre-existing species, much as the way children are descended from their parents and grandparents, a tree, a family tree. The significance here is that clearly there's a natural explanation for the origin of species, as natural as children descending from their parents. This, for Darwin, is the end of special creation. No longer do we require that species would be created in whole by some mysterious process. There's quite a natural explanation. But he's not going to tell anybody. He's 28 years old. He's barely been home a year. And this flies in the face of everything that his very accomplished mentors at Cambridge had taught him. This flew in the, in the face of what the Anglican Church believed. This was heresy. And this was professional suicide. This was radical. But he keeps this mental rioting going. And in the next year, he even comes up with this idea of natural selection, this competitive process that will cause slightly different forms to become even more different from each other in the making of new species. Now Darwin, as he's a couple years into this process of theorizing, he's feeling a little bit exasperated because, remember, he's a great student of the new geology. Now the new geology was saying, look, the, the land forms of the Earth were shaped by natural processes. The Earth was much older than people had originally thought. And he thinks about astronomy, where, of course, for centuries, astronomers have been telling us that there are laws that govern the movement of planets and other objects in the heavens. He's saying, you know, what, why, why would we accept what the astronomer says? Why would we accept what the geologist says? And, and, and yet, you know, life is something different, something special. And here's just a little comment he enters in one of his notebooks that I'm pretty fond of. It's a notebook, 1838. He writes, we can allow satellites, planets, suns, universes, nay, whole systems of universes to be governed by laws. But the smallest insect, we wish to be created at once by special act. Here's a guy who'd collected a lot of beetles, a lot of other bugs. And he thought, no, you know, no creator is going to bother with a little bug. Why does that require a special act? My gosh, if, if, all, if all the planets are governed by natural laws, if the, if the reshaping of the Earth is governed by natural laws, and he's witnessed volcanoes and earthquakes, etc., why not life? But he's not going to tell anybody. He keeps this to himself. He has a golden opportunity to spill the beans, because all the time that he is wrestling privately with these thought about, thoughts about species, he's writing up his version, his account of the voyage of the Beagle. 
Now, the book that that originally appears in is this book with an extremely long title that I'll let you look at. The two other parts of the book are done by Fitzroy and another previous captain of the Beagle. And Darwin's responsible for just describing, essentially, where he went in the world and what he saw. And he's going to have to eventually deal with those birds of the Galapagos. So what's he going to say? He knows. He knows species change. He's convinced of it. He's writing his first major book. What's he going to do? He's going to dodge it. Watch this. It is clear that if several islands have each their peculiar species of the same genera, when these are placed together, they will have a wide range of character. Think of all those finches in the Galapagos with all their different beaks, etc. Um, <clears throat> but there's not space in this work to enter on this curious subject. <laughs> That's it. That's all you get. When Wallace is younger than Darwin, this is 1839, when Wallace later reads these words, he figures the great Darwin, the great naturalist, had left this question of the origin of species wide open. Now, Darwin continued working on this problem intensively. By 1842, he sat down and he wrote a full sketch of his species theory, took in pencil 35 pages. The text exists today. He even got to hold it a few months ago. Um, and then in, by 1844, he expanded that into a 230-page work. Now, that's not, you know, hobby work, right? And it has a table of contents, a table of contents that's eerily reminiscent to a big book that's not going to appear for a long time, a very famous big book. And he decides, as he finishes his essay, he said he's now married to his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood, of the Wedgwood Pottery Fortune. He says, I've completed my essay on my species theory, and it, it may be valuable someday, so please see to it that should I die to have it published. So he was willing to have people read it if he was dead, but <laughs> not while he was alive. So he was firmly convinced of natural selection, firmly convinced that species changed. He just wasn't divulging it, certainly not publicly. Only in the mid-1840s does he start divulging little bits of it to a few scientists. So Wallace is privy to none of this. He is not, he can't read Darwin's mind. He doesn't know about these essays that Darwin has got in his desk at home. So, of course, had Darwin disclosed what he thought 15 years earlier, Wallace might not have been in an open lifeboat in the middle of the Atlantic, and we might never heard of Wallace. But there he was. Now, of course, if Wallace had not been rescued, we wouldn't have heard of him either. And he was rescued. Ten days and ten nights passed when a vessel was seen, and by night we were on board her, much rejoiced to have escaped the death on the wide ocean whence none would have ever come to tell the tale. Now, I've been reading these quotes. I want to show you where this letter comes from. This is the actual text, the, the actual uh, letter I'm, I'm getting these excerpts from. Wallace, once he was on board that rescue ship, started a letter to a friend in Brazil that described his whole ordeal, leaving from the upper reaches of the Amazon, gathering up his animals, coming back to Para, boarding the boat, the fire, the shipwreck, the time in the lifeboat, etc. And then the actual ordeal on the rescue boat, which gets hit by two or three more storms, waters crashing in through skylights on top of Wallace. It's a, it's a real joy ride. And uh, you can see, it actually has beautiful handwriting, but you see all these splotches. They're, they're on the original letter. And for all I know, that's, that's sea spray. So he composes this letter in sections, all right? So he's now told his friend this far that he's, he's survived. But a little bit later on in the letter, you know, he explains in this whole ordeal, you know, that 50 times since I left Para in Brazil have I vowed if I once reached England never to trust myself on the ocean. And then a few days later, he adds to this, uh, but good resolutions soon fade. <laughs> see the corner of it there. So when he finally gets home, despite his loss, his near-death experience, he had nothing to show for the places he had been. He had no collection. He had no facts towards the problem of the origin of species. The question, in his mind, was wide open in 1852. He decides he's going to go out again. Spirit and deed. And it's, of course, Wallace who's eventually going to make Darwin go public. 
So the first question Wallace has to face is, where am I going to go? Well, he thinks, well, not the Amazon. His friend Henry Walter Bates is still there. He says, Bates has got that covered. So one man can cover the entire Amazon. So he wants to go someplace new, someplace relatively unexplored, but might have pretty good pickings. And so he decides to head for the Malay Archipelago. And he gets there in April of 1854, landing in Singapore. And over the course of the next eight years, he goes island hopping from Singapore all the way to New Guinea. He makes 96 crossings totaling 14,000 miles and collects 120,000 specimens. These would be secure. But he has the same problem when he lands in Singapore. He still has to make a living. So he has to go out and start looking for treasures. What's he looking for? He's looking for things like this. Beautiful bird wing butterflies, named for their giant wingspan, but sought after because of their really vivid wing color patterns. So he wants these for himself, but of course he's got to collect some more to satisfy the market at home. But, you know, while paying attention to where you see, find animals like this is, makes sense for a paid collector, he's paying very, very close attention to where he finds these things. So these are some of Wallace's bird wing butterflies that we actually have from his collections. And what Wallace notices is that these bird wing butterflies, slightly different from one another, and certain kinds are only found on particular islands. These are very different from the butterflies he collected in the Amazon. He only finds bird wing butterflies in the Malay Archipelago, and he finds slightly different forms on different islands. These bird wings signify to Wallace exactly what the birds of the Galapagos signified to Darwin. Slightly different forms on different islands. Now Wallace has no inhibitions about his scientific thoughts, his observations in the field, and he starts dashing off notes to natural history magazines and scientific journals really as they occur to him, sending them, sending them home to England. And in his first year, in the Malay Archipelago, he composes this paper. Look at the title. This is 1855. On the law which has regulated the introduction of new species. Fairly to the point. He calls this his Sarawak law. He composes this on the island of Sarawak. What does he say? Well, he thinks about these bird wind butterflies, and he said, you know, the most closely allied species are found in geographical proximity. I see bird wings in the Malay Archipelago. I didn't see them in the Amazon. I saw different groups of butterflies in the Amazon. Groups are found, and members of those groups are found in close proximity. You know, I think, this is his law, I think every species has come into existence, co into existence coincident both in space and time with a pre-existing, closely allied species. He's trying to explain why would such similar species be found near each other, why they're coming into existence in proximity to them. Here's a good one. You know, I think the best mode of representing the natural arrangement of species is a branching tree. <laughs> Remember, he has not read any of Darwin's still private theory. So here's his paper. It gets published. This is the published form of the paper. What's the reaction? Grumbling. Stop your theorizing, Wallace. Send us some more of those bird wings. He's ignored. So he has to keep moving. And he keeps moving. Now, you got to appreciate, he's in a pretty much unknown lands, not full of fellow countrymen. He needs help finding these things in the forest. So of course, he's going to call upon local experts. He calls upon, for example, the Dayaks of Borneo. These were, of course, very familiar with all the creatures of the forest. And they even had their own sort of natural history collecting hobby. Charming. They bundled their enemies' heads in their longhouses. Fortunately, none of these are Wallace's, or else you never would have heard of them again. Okay, So they help Wallace find some things. And he keeps moving his way from west to east across these islands, hopping from island to island to island. And at one point, he makes the rather short journey just from the island of Bali over to Lombok. And as he still moves further east, he notices there's quite a dramatic changeover in fauna. He realizes that 
you know, in the Western Islands, in places like Sumatra, you have things like tigers, and on Java, you have rhinoceri, and Borneo, you have monkeys and orangutans. But when he moves to Eastern Islands, he finds things like tree kangaroos and cuscus, marsupials. You got marsupials over here, and you got these other sort of mammals over there. What's going on? He says, you know, it's, it's as if there was a line separating the Western and Eastern Islands, and you have sort of Fauna on the, this side of the line, characteristic of, of Asia, but over here you have things characteristic of Australia, marsupials, like the kangaroos you know, we know so well from Australia. What's going on here? What could explain this distribution of animals across the Malay archipelago? And he says, my law, my Sarawak law, because I say closely related species come into existence with pre-existing species. And he says, I think what's happened is that these islands over here, these eastern islands in Australia, they were once connected. And what's happened is, is that um, those marsupials have then sort of adapted to the different islands that they now live on. Species change. That's what Wallace realizes. He's the founder of a field we now refer to as biogeography, that there is an explanation for the distribution of species on the planet. And he says quite explicitly, that explanation is not the creationist explanation. The creationist says, the species are created to suit the habitat sort of into which they are placed. Now, to him, there's no difference between the Borneo jungles and the New Guinea jungles. Indistinguishable. They're jungles with a canopy. Why does he find monkeys and orangutans over here and tree kangaroos living in the same habitat over here? No, there's a historical explanation. These species are descended from closely allied pre-existing species. They're not placed there like pieces chess pieces on a chessboard. So he rejects special creation explicitly in a, in a paper he writes. It's the end of creationism for Wallace, species evolve. So the next question for him is how? Well, he keeps moving east. Oh, sorry, I should mention this is now called the Wallace Line, 150 years later. He moves east to an island called Ternate. And one day, in a dilapidated hut, wrapped in a blanket on an 88 degree day, baking in a malarial fever, the answer occurs to him. How do species change? He says, well, here's, here's a veteran of eight years in the jungle. He says, you know, the life of wild animals is a struggle for existence and to provide for their infant offspring. And you know, he's seen a lot of species and he's seen a lot of individual members of species. And he says, you know, perhaps all the variations must have some definite effect however slight, in the habits or capacities of the individual. A variety having slightly increased powers must inevitably in time acquire a superiority in numbers. And he calls this on the tendency of species to depart indefinitely from the original type. <laughs> okay. Not exactly poetry, buddy. Serviceable. So as his fever clears, and he writes this down in just a few days, as his fever clears, he's got another paper, and he is going to send it to England for publication. And he sends it to a naturalist with whom he'd made, started some correspondence a year earlier. He sends it to Darwin. Mm -hmm. And Darwin receives it, and he's shocked. He's shocked. He tells his friends, he says, Wallace could not have written a better abstract of my theory if he had just had my notebooks in front of him. Why? Well, let's look at actually what Darwin was writing. A, this is unpublished manuscript from Darwin. He had, was working on a big book on species at his home and down a year earlier. This is February, March, 1857. He's working on this chapter. Look at the chapter header. The struggle for existence as bearing on natural selection. And what did Darwin say? He says, all of nature is at war. The struggle very often falls on the egg and seed or on the seedling. Any variation, however infinitely slight, if it did promote during any part of life, even in the slightest degree, the welfare of the being, such variation would tend to be preserved or selected. Look, look at the resemblance. Neither man knows what the other has been writing or thinking. Great minds think alike. These are two veterans of the jungle. These are two men who had both visited numerous islands, seen species that, was, that were slightly different from each other. These are both collectors who had collected numerous examples of every individual species they could. They knew about variation, and they thought that variation might affect 
the capacities of those individuals. They come up with very similar ideas. Okay, so what's Darwin going to do? Well, what Wallace asked him in his letters, he said, if you think this is worth publishing, <laughs> um, <laughs> please pass it on to Charles Lyell for, for publication. Lyell is the geologist. And Darwin does. And Lyell and Darwin's friend Joseph Hooker, the botanist, decide that the best thing to do is to present Wallace's paper and an excerpt from Darwin's work. They were both privy to Darwin's thoughts by then. This is 1858. Darwin had divulged his, really, his complete idea, just not published it. And they said the best thing to do would be to have Darwin publish an abstract of his theory alongside Wallace. And so at the Linnaean Society, on July 1st, 1858, these papers were presented. And here it is, the published proceedings. The debut to the world of the idea of natural selection. Yeah, they, Wallace's original title is there, but that didn't seem to catch on, on the tendency of species to form varieties. What happened? Nobody paid any attention. Wallace wasn't there. Wallace was still thousands of miles away in the Malay Archipelago. He wouldn't be home for four more years. Darwin wasn't there. The month of June, his son was struck with scarlet fever, died, and on that very day, July 1st, he was burying Charles Jr. in the family graveyard. The man presiding over this meeting later wrote at this, of, of the proceedings of the Linnaean Society, that nothing in particular happened that year that revolutionized their science. Okay, but obviously Darwin had a greater incentive to finally complete his big work. And so he poured it on, and next year, this book appeared, Darwin's book on species. Now people paid attention. Well, why they pay attention? Well, they paid attention because it was a great synthesis. It had marshaled essentially all the available information from natural history, from the fossil record, from all sorts of uh, sources. It was argued clearly and persuasively, I think often phrased eloquently. He had a running start. A lot of the language he had written in the early 1840s was imported into the origin of species. And he wrote it so that lay people could understand it. It wasn't technical. Completely readable. It was an argument. An argument which he weighed both sides of all the issues. The strengths and the weaknesses of his theory. Pretty unique, even 150 years later. It heralded the end of creationism and a whole revolutionary new view of nature. And it set the agenda for the next 150 years and hopefully many years beyond. And one of the immediate questions was this, this, about this idea of natural selection. This was the full explication of this idea of natural selection. And Naturalists were wondering, you know, is natural selection really strong and sensitive enough to shape the fine differences among species? Is this, does this really exist? Does Darwin's idea even have any validity? Well, that same year of 1859, remember our old friend Henry Walter Bates? Well, he dragged his rather dilapidated carcass home from the Amazon. After 11 years in the Amazon, 10 on his own. He had collected more than 14,000 different species, 8,000 of which were new to science. And he had suffered. He had been robbed at times, left shoeless, clothless, penniless, malnourished, goodness knows how many tropical diseases, hostile tribes, all sorts of insects, you name it. But later in his memoir, you know what he said? The saddest day was in his life was when the boat took him away from the shoreline of Brazil and he could no longer see land, a land he described as a land of perpetual summer. And then images of England started to come back into his mind of <laughs> gray, rainy, oh, sorry, I shouldn't really rub that in, should I? Okay. So he arrived home in the summer of 1859, and he was organizing his massive collection when Darwin's book appears. And it gives him a framework for everything he had seen in the jungle. But he realizes he's got some gems for the great naturalist, and he strikes up a correspondence with Darwin. He says, I think I've got a glimpse into the laboratory where nature manufactures her new species. Oh, this is music to Darwin's ears. He's taking a thrashing in the press. Anonymous reviews, 
signed reviews, whatever it was, he's getting beat on. But now here's a naturalist with 11 years' experience in the jungle saying, Mr. Darwin, I have some new information for you. Now Bates was feeling a bit discouraged because there was no scientific position waiting for him. He was an amateur, just like Wallace. Right? A poor amateur. I mean, not poor as a scientist, but I mean, poor as in money. So he comes back. He has to live with his family for three years. But during this correspondence, Darwin becomes his number one rooter. He's rooting Bates on. Bates, write up your, write up your work for scientific journals. Write a memoir of your travels. I'm sure it will be fascinating. So he's, he's Bates' biggest fan. Just keeps encouraging him, encouraging him. So bit by bit, Bates starts disclosing to Darwin what he's seen. And what he says is, he says, you know, what I noticed was that I often found completely harmless creatures that resembled noxious or poisonous ones living in the same district, like this beetle that looked a lot like this wasp living in the same area, or something like this caterpillar that at one end so resembled the head of a small pit viper that when I carried it into the village, everyone ran off terrified. And he saw lots of examples like this, but no creatures left a stronger impression on Bates than the butterflies of the Amazon. And he discovered something truly wonderful and original. At first glance, you would think that these butterflies would be close relatives, maybe even the same species. Same with these two. But Bates has a much better eye, and he noticed not at all. It turns out that these two butterflies are close relatives. They belong to the same family. And these two butterflies belong to a completely different family. Yet on close inspection, clearly this one resembles this one fairly well, and this one resembles this one fairly well. What's going on? Well, what Bates noticed was that when he handled these butterflies down here on the bottom, they often gave off some kind of noxious fluid. And when he let them dry out, for example, on his specimen table, lizards and birds wouldn't carry these things away. Nor, unlike other butterflies, these butterflies weren't pursued by birds through the, through the jungle. But these butterflies were not noxious or anything like that. So he realized, wait, by imitating the appearance of noxious forms, they were going to gain an advantage. So whereas these two species belong to the same genus called Leptalis, these two butterflies that they're imitating belong to a different family. They're gaining some advantage by mimicking the noxious form. Furthermore, when Bates hit, looked carefully, he said, you know, not every member of this species is a good mimic. They're variable. So it's not as though these butterflies are being stamped out the way a toy is stamped out of a press. They're slightly variable. And that tells them there must be a natural process at work that's making these butterflies and making them slightly different. Natural selection. So what's he say? He says, to exist at all in a given locality are leptalis, which are these butterflies. She must wear a certain dress, and those of its varieties that do not come up to the mark are rigidly sacrificed. Poor mimics are eaten by the birds. I believe the case offers the most beautiful proof of the theory of natural selection. This was not a coincidence. These mimics only appeared in the same district. It wasn't like this was a northern Brazilian and a southern Brazilian butterfly. You only saw this when they overlapped in territory. Well, you know what else thought it was a beautiful example of natural selection? Uh, Mr. Darwin. This is the letter he wrote to Bates. Footnote. It's at Case Western Reserve University. You never know where you're going to find Darwin material. Right here, what does he tell Bates? He says, in my opinion, is one of the most admirable and remarkable papers I ever read in my life. Now, he wants to make sure that nobody misses this point. So he writes even a review of Bates' work. And he says, you know, we may never come this close of seeing the making of a new species on this planet than what Bates has shown us. Batesian mimicry, the mimicking by some harmless creature of a noxious or poisonous one, becomes a key underpinning of Darwin's theory of natural selection. Darwin had relied very heavily on the analogy to domestic breeding to explain natural selection. Now he had another naturalist coming out of the jungle saying, look, I've seen this at work. How else could you explain the similarity of appearance between these creatures and the advantages that they would gain? Now this is 1862, and finally, that very same year, Wallace comes home from the Malay Archipelago. Now, the three men are good friends. 
their lives are going to be closely intertwined for the rest of their days. Remember, Wallace and Bates' friendship goes back to the 1840s. Darwin is Bates' number one fan. Bates is Darwin's number one supporter. And Wallace and Darwin have been carrying on a very warm and open correspondence for several years. They, in fact, right after the publication of their papers and things, had exchanged letters and it fully discussed how each felt about the way the arrangement was handled. And, it, and that, all that correspondence is available. They were looking forward to seeing each other. Darwin invited both men out to his house to spend a weekend. Darwin would even meet Wallace when, they went into, when Darwin was in London. And all three of them promoted this theory of evolution by natural selection. Now, the pictures you usually get of these guys, look they look like this, right? <laughs> Okay. Usually the fourth guy over here is Karl Marx, right? You know, just to, just to kind of lump them with radicals. But of course, you know, these were young men, and they had a very strong bond, having spent all these years out in the wilds and having made these discoveries. So I'd say, that, you know, their voyages, their work, they mark a golden age of evolutionary biology. But the last thing I'd want to imply tonight, you know, is that the, the great adventures were over. Far from it. Uh, there was a lot more to explore and to be discovered, particularly in expanding the fossil record. And uh, I guess, well, for about 20 bucks, you can read about another 150 years of these sorts of adventures. <laughs> but, but moreover, I submit that right now, we're in a, a, new, a second golden age of evolutionary science. And that's because we're no longer just restricted to looking at remarkable creatures. We can see how they're made and how they evolve. We're getting glimpses from the laboratory into this evolutionary process. And modern biologists are collectors too, putting together menageries, you know, much like the one Wallace tried to bring home from the Amazon. We've got, oh, you know, a sloth and armadillo and platypus, and wallaby, chimpanzee. Only we're not putting them in a zoo and we're not stuffing them, throwing them in a natural history museum. We're taking their DNA. And we're assembling a massive DNA record of evolution, 52, ma 52 mammals in that collection so far, more than 2,000 species altogether. And what do we see in this DNA record? We see how the fittest are made. We see evolution at its most fundamental level. We see how different forms have evolved. And as we mine this massive record, I, I, I would say you know, we share the same sense of wonder and surprise and discovery as the pioneers. You know, only we don't have to kind of barf our way to work in the morning like Darwin did, or, or confront malaria as virtually everybody else did, or, or, uh, or headhunters, I guess, you know, just peer review. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about cannibals. So, <laughs> we no longer stare at creatures like this butterfly, you know, just merely dazzled as, as Bates was, you know, by its, by its external beauty, but we can now see the genes in action that are responsible for producing these beautiful patterns and for producing diverse forms. You know, and, and okay, well, what about the fossil record? You know, what could be better than fossils like these that were collected by, you know, Darwin and so many more people over the next 150 years? Well, how about DNA from fossils? An entirely new way of peering into the past that not only Darwin could not possibly imagine, but really most modern biologists didn't imagine could be done on such a scale as it's being done today. But those tales are for another day. And if you want some hardcore stuff, it's 4 o'clock tomorrow. Um, my task to was to highlight where all this started. And among the past adventurers, the one we celebrate this year, and above all, is Darwin. Why? Well, certainly, the scientists in this room would have their own answers to that. But I'm going to give Wallace the last word. Now, there's been a lot of speculation. How did Wallace really feel about the arrangement where he had come up with this idea, sent it in, Darwin had read it, and the two ideas were published together? You know, how, did, how would Wallace feel like that? Or how did Wallace feel about the publication of The Origin of Species? Well, fortunately, we have a documentary record that can give us insights into that. And this is a letter I want to share with you that Wallace wrote. It's kind of nice. He wrote it on Christmas Eve in 1860. Now, Wallace is still in the Malay Archipelago. He's on that island of Ternate. He crisscrossed the various islands and went back to the island of Ternate, where he first came up with the idea. 
natural selection. And he's writing to Bates, and Bates is in England. Now remember, these are old pals. They go back a long time. What Wallace has done is he's just read on the origin of species. Evidently, he read it through like five times over. Lots of annotations on it. We still have his copy of On the Origin of Species. So when the Origin of Species was published, Darwin sent him a copy. And Wallace just gobbled it up. So now he's writing to Bates with his impressions. And I would say a private letter, something that was never intended for me to, show, for to be shown in classrooms 150 years later, would reveal Wallace's true feelings. So what does he say? He says, I know not how or to whom to express fully my admiration for Darwin's book its overwhelming argument, and its admirable tone and spirit. Mr. Darwin has created a new science and a new philosophy, and I believe that never has such a complete illustration of a new branch of human knowledge been due to the labors and researches of a single man. I'm not sure such graciousness exists in 21st century science. <laughs> but that's how Wallace felt. And he felt that way for the rest of his days. He outlived Darwin by 30 years. He always referred to this as Darwinism and Darwin's theory. He was always deferential to Darwin. He dedicated his own travel log on the Malay Archipelago, front page, to Darwin with his greatest esteem. He was a pallbearer at Darwin's funeral. So these men were very close. So this is how Wallace felt. And of course, there was a lot more to come from Darwin, things that we admire. 150 years later, for, of Darwin's body of work. He wrote lots more books, had major more, uh, several more great ideas, um, incredibly productive, well past on the origin of species. So that's why we're celebrating Darwin. <laughs> so what I'd like to do in these last couple of minutes is just share with you my birthday wishes for Darwin. Um, first, that more people will appreciate the, the great spirit that drove young Charles and many other young men and women to leave behind loved ones and to risk their health and safety to follow their dreams and to explore the unknown. And second, that many more people will come to embrace the, the grandeur and the beauty and the story of life that they reveal. Now, I, I hope you feel as I do. That's actually, I think, a Peter Frampton line. Um, so do you feel as I do? <laughs> this is for you, then. A little birthday card. Are you still willing to take questions? Sure, and sure, sure. We yeah. need to make a public announcement. Two other cars were damaged by this tree, okay. and they're looking for the owners. Okay. Uh,